my mother, the person and the patient is an original podcast written and hosted by me, Fartou Mukuso. This podcast is about my mother, Timira Abdisemet, a yaya we call her, that's the Somali word for grandmother, and her great grandkids call her a yaya too, and that's their way of saying great grandmother. After months and months of sleepless nights, finally, my mother started to sleep through the night, which was the best thing ever. She would get to bed on her own, 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, and she would stay in bed for the entire night. Even when she woke up because she needed to use the bathroom, or maybe she needs to get a glass of water or a snack, she will go and do exactly what she needed to do, and then get back to bed. After a while, I stopped closing my bedroom door and her bedroom door, but even then, she would just walk by my bedroom door without calling to me, without coming in to ask me questions or to engage me in discussion. She would just go straight back to bed. That was the best thing ever. All I needed to do in the morning was to make sure she woke up, she brushed, she showered, and she had breakfast. And on my lunch break, I would call her and tell her, mom, it's time to eat lunch. After a while, I noticed the food would be exactly the same amount as it was when I went for work. So I realized she wasn't really eating lunch or she wasn't eating the right amount or she wasn't eating the right lunch kind of food. So to deal with that, I decided I was going to prepare her lunch the same way I prepared for my lunch and for the children's lunches. So I would put it in a container and I would put it in a specific spot in the fridge where I would remember. And I would call her on my lunch break and say, mom, open the fridge and take out the container with the blue lid on the second shelf next to the cheese. Did you do that? Yes. Take the lid off, open the microwave door, put the container in and press two minutes and start. When it's done, mom, use the oven mitts and take the container out, get a plate from the cupboard, put the food in and take it to the table. Give it a few seconds. Mom, did you take the plate to the table? Yes. Do you have your spoon and something to drink? Yes. Enjoy. And I'll get off and have my own lunch. That worked for a while beautifully. And I thought all the horrors doctors were telling me of what Alzheimer's would look like, my mother must have plateaued now because all the paranoia, all the accusations, confusions that marked the beginning of the disease were all but gone now. We found a way to manage to keep her safe at home, to make sure she ate and she was safe. So that worked for a while. One morning, I woke up and the house was exceptionally quiet because sometimes when my mother was awake before she left her bedroom, she would sing. She had these beautiful songs that she remembered from when she was young. So when I made it to the um, kitchen, it was maybe half past six, and I something just told me I need to go check my mother's bedroom because I didn't usually wake her up until it was, you know, 7, 20, 7, 15. So I opened her door, and her bedroom was empty. She wasn't there. Where did she go? I checked the bathroom. The bathroom is empty. Maybe she went downstairs to use the downstairs bathroom. I checked. It's empty. I checked all the kids' rooms. They haven't seen her. Have you seen your grandmother? No, I haven't. So I come back up. And as soon as I come back to the kitchen, I see the patio sliding door leading to the backyard is open. I check and my mother is not there. So I go to the front of the house and find her um, running shoes and they're there. So if she left, she must be wearing her flip-flops. That was late March. It wasn't deep winter, but it still wasn't warm enough that you could leave the house with your nightgown and flip-flops. So right away, I jumped in my car and I started driving all around the neighborhood looking for my mother, looking for my mother because she had a walking path where she used to walk every morning, but that was before she got sick, before the onset of Alzheimer's. She hadn't done that for two years by then, but nevertheless, I drove around her path. 
I couldn't find her. My daughter got in her car too and went a different direction. So we spent about 20 minutes, half an hour looking for her and we can't find her. So finally, I thought I need to go back home and call the police. So I come home and I call the police in their non-emergency number. Somebody answers and I say, ah, my mother has Alzheimer's early stages. Um, she went to bed last night. I don't know when, but when we woke up this morning, she wasn't in her bed. So the, the person who answered the phone said to me, okay, give me a minute. And then a couple of minutes later, she came back to the line and she said, what does your mother look like? What was she wearing? Uh, how tall was she? Does she speak English? All that. And then she said, give me a couple of minutes. And she came back and she said, an officer is going to bring your mother to your address. So what's your address? I told her my address. And about 10 minutes later, a police officer pulled into my driveway and my mother comes out of the back of his car wearing her, um, you know, the little thin gown she went to bed with, with her flip-flops. And so confused, she doesn't know why the police officer took her in his car, what is going on. So, um... I brought her in and I was so grateful, so terrified of what could have happened to her and so grateful that she continued to walk around the neighborhood. I don't know for how long. At the end, she knocked at the door because she didn't know where home was and she thought that was home. And luckily, the family that opened the door, they didn't speak her language, but they could tell she was really confused and she wasn't dressed properly to be out there. So they let her sit in their house and they called the police and they told her we have this woman who seems confused and she doesn't know who she is and she doesn't speak English and she doesn't know where her home is. And they gave the police the description of what she looked like and a police officer was dispatched to this family's house and they were trying to figure things out when I called the, the operator of the non-emergency line and told them I was missing my mother and that operator made the connection and luckily my mother came home with not much um, harm to her but the rest of us the children and I were really rattled so that day, after I came back from work, I called an alarm system company and I had an alarm system installed in the house because I cannot lock us in for fire reasons, but I wanted to have an alarm system set up. So if my mother woke up and opened it, one of the main doors, the patio sliding door or the main door of the house, the alarm would be tripped and that would wake me up. And that's how I dealt with it. But I realized soon enough, another obstacle would be thrown in my way by Alzheimer's. When you listen to how we arrived at my mother's diagnosis and what followed. It's so easy to see her just as the patient, to see her as nothing more than the disease that reduced her to shell of her old self. But I want to also to tell you about my mother, the person, the fierce woman that told her stories unapologetically, celebrating the beautiful parts and harsh realities equally. I want to share with you the stories she told us about her life as a girl growing up in a small village, the tales that marked her adulthood. I want to share with you all her losses and the ultimate winnings. Following is one of those stories reconstructed for my childhood memory. If the villagers came to the city as an escape from the drought, they found no comfort. The unyielding heat showed no sign of relenting. The temperature rose with the morning sun and continued to soar with every hour that followed. It gave no reprieve. Even after the unparalleled darkness of night encroached, filling every crevice of the desolate camp, the villagers saw no reduction in the temperature. The heat oozed from the dark black earth and crawled all over them, 
like the insects that buzzed all day. And like the dry heat of the village, the city heat came in layers, heavy and thick with moisture, even huddling under the broad umbrella of the Qura tree. The air stood still, sucking all energy out of them. Despite the landowners claim the brook they collected water from was on the other side of the market, at least an hour walk each way. After breakfast, all the mothers, including Timurus mother, set out from the camp, carrying a large clay water pot on their back. They made three trips to gather enough water to cook and wash. The fourth trip took them to the market to buy food and firewood. Timira's father came home every night a few minutes before sunset with the men of the ten families that set up camp in the city's periphery. The work in the village planting, tending to unharvesting crops was difficult, but here, their work seemed harder. Every evening, her father returned a little thinner, a tad bit shorter, diminished, but he didn't complain. He wouldn't complain, but her mother would. They wink at each other before they tell us the price for meat or milk. Her mother had relayed her father each night as she handed him his prayer mat. Because they are charging you more? Timira's father asked. I know they are, her mother said. This is the land of the devil. Like many other people from the village, Timira's mother held a deep mistrust for the city and its people, cheating like the one that rented us this for a home. I'm sorry. Timira's father sounded exhausted even though he would never admit to it. Why did we come here? Her mother didn't look at him as she handed him the water pitcher to wash for the Makhri prayer, to do work fit for a boy, earning pennies on the hour. We would have died in yet. Her father spoke with conviction. It seemed he'd contemplated the same point before her mother had asked. At least we have water here. At what cost? Timur's mother rocked the baby who began to whimper in her arms. This city is our grave, not our home. Alarmed by her mother's statement, Timira ran to her. No one is going to die, she said. Unlike her father, her mother never held back or treated her like a child that shouldn't know this or that. When someone passed in the village, other adults will tell the children this was the person's time to go. Her mother never did that, not with Timiro anyway. They were sick and didn't get proper treatment, she would say. Or the family didn't want to sell their precious cow to pay for the doctor. She had a practical way about her. Is Nina, she's a child of eight or nine. Timira's father would use her age at the time to stop her mother from revealing too much. You're talking to her like an adult, old enough to know, she would say. That night was different. Timira's mother didn't respond in her usual way, didn't tell her precisely what she thought about their situation in the city. She said nothing. She took Timira's hand in hers, squeezed it tight, then released it. She repeated the squeeze three more times. Timira didn't understand what message her mother was giving her with the touch of her hand. But once she let her go, she turned around and ran back to the spot where her friends Ambiya and Saadiya were playing. Soon they were immersed laughing in a game of truth and dare. It was the beginning of the fourth week when Timira's baby brother Isaac woke up wailing. Her mother picked him out of his cot and tied him to her back with one of her shawls. But he continued to cry, as if someone had a sharp knife to his limbs, cutting his flesh off the bones. He threw his head back, pushing the heels of his feet against her mother's lower back. 
he was almost standing up. From that day on, her mother couldn't put Isaac down. They only gained a slight reprieve from his wailing if he was tied to her mother's chest while she did all her chores, carrying water and food from the market, cooking and washing. The load was too heavy for her, but she couldn't leave him behind with Timiro anymore. She did that once, and by the time she came back, his wailing had reduced Farah and Timiro into sobbing fits. Not one, but her mother had faced three crying children. Her father came home only to be greeted by her mother's frayed nerves. As the days passed, Isaac's condition only got worse. A boy who walked, talked, and fed himself at 14 months now regressed. He refused to eat or drink unless her mother bathed the yard while feeding him. A week later, for the first time since his first birth year, he wet his pants while on her chest. The urine ran down the front of Timur's mother's dress, the liquid pouring in the heels of her sandals. She threw her dress, his shirt, shorts, and underwear into the wash basin. After ten days of such torture, Timira's mother sold the ring and a necklace. Her parents took Isaac to see a doctor in the city. Timira and Farah waited for hours for their return. What did the doctor say? Timira asked. He said there is nothing wrong with him, not physically anyway. It sounded as if she wished the doctor had diagnosed him with a disease. Maybe it's this tin house. I don't blame him. We're all sick of this oppressive heat. No matter how many different approaches her parents tried, Isaac wouldn't stop crying. In his fit, he would throw up all over whoever holding him and relieve himself. Such act made Farah and Timiro join him. Her mother was often at a loss to decide which of the three needed comfort first. On a few of those occasions, she would join her children in crying. Here, Timira's mother would hand the baby to her father as soon as he'd finished his makhri prayer. Hold him while I get the meal, she'd say. But her eyes said that she couldn't wait to be relieved of his haq. To have someone else hear him cry to no end and no remedy. Timira's father, on his part, tried to smile as he placed Isaac on his lap. The novelty of moving from one parent to another lasted for only a few seconds. Soon Isaac would hit his high falsetto, and her father couldn't scramble to his feet fast enough to at least bring him to a lower note. The family dinner was always consumed fast. Her father took a few bites as he rocked on his heels back and forth. The only peace came at night. After the evening meal, Timira's father would walk with Isaac out in the yard, pointing to the sky to show him the stars. His wailing would gradually subside, giving way to quiet whimpers. Maybe Isaac and I would sleep outside, Timira's father suggested one night, so you and the children can get rest. His head on her father's shoulder, Ishaq's chest rose and fell in gentle, rhythmic motion. His face was so serene, Timira wished they could keep him like that. Unlike the open-mouthed crying at the top of his lung image he terrorized them with during the day, her mother smiled. A genuine ear-to-ear -ear smile at the reprieve offered to her. By the time Timira closed her eyes, except for the dogs barking in the distance, the chaos of the day would dissolve into a total silence. She looked forward to nights from the beginning of the day, her mother on the mat between her and Farah. Sleep, her mother would whisper, for tomorrow isn't promised to anyone. Before being swept away by the current of slumber, 
Tamira promised herself she would ask her mother what she meant by that. Did she think they were going to die in their sleep? Waking to Ishaq's shriek in the morning, she didn't remember to ask her about it until it was too late and the chance was lost to them forever. The call for the Fajr prayer from the city masjid merged with the rooster's call to start the day. Timira opened her eyes and scanned the room. Her mother was still asleep, her face to her and her back to Farah. Timira's mother had her right hand under her head, the left draped over her face. Her knees bent to her chest, wrapped her in a protective shell. Her long curly hair came out of the scarf she'd wrapped them in the night before. The earned curls covered the upper part of her face. In that position, she seemed small, like a girl. She could have passed as Timira's sister, not her mother. The rooster crowed again at the end of the second call for the prayer, loud and determined. This time... Without competing with the prayer call, the sound came sharper than it did before. Timira laid on her back and closed her eyes to enjoy the lull of silence that came every morning between the rooster's last call and the sound of her father's footsteps. As he'd always done, she'd imagined him entering the house, Isaac cradled in his arms. She squeezed her eyes harder. Soon, her mother's eyes would dart around the room as if she were disappointed in the morning's early arrival. She'd not look at Timira's father, for she hadn't woken up early to make him breakfast. Instead, she would display a nervous smile as Timira's father bent down to hand over the baby. It would only take seconds before her mother's hands shook with anxiety. Her father's brows arced with worry. Isaac's precursor whimpering which led to his wailing would soon begin. Her mother would get only enough time to get Ishaq in her bosom before he erupted into full-on wailing. The first brust of it was the worst. No matter how many days she'd endured it, the first one in each morning startled Timira. It surprised the entire family because the same expression appeared on all their faces. The morning of the loss, the lull seemed to go on for a little longer. Timira squeezed her eyes even harder to appreciate such luxury and moved a little closer to her mother. That's when it came, the loudest cry she'd ever heard. Even in the height of his agony, Isaac didn't reach that level. It was so loud that all three of them, her, her mother, and Farah, jumped up and ran outside the tin room. It was still dark. The landscape caught between night and daybreak. The sun wasn't entirely out. Only the hint of the hot day ahead hung over the air. People darted out of their tin rooms and rushed into the yard in different states of undress. What happened? Her mother started the questions. Others followed her with the same inquiry, as if her father didn't hear the first hundred times. He circled the mat he was laying on. He pointed at where his head lay before he began to beat his chest, blood trickled down to his belt. Where is Isaac? Timira's mother must have been the first one to realize that her father stood before them, his hands empty, no wailing baby inside. Where is my baby? Her mother took her father's shoulders in her hands and shook him back and forth. He didn't resist and flopped like a child's plaything against her tugging and pushing. Where is he? She pulled him to her. Where is my child? It was two people, Timir's father said. 
One held me down and the other pulled the baby up. Who left that behind? The elder stood in front of Timur's father and pointed at the four long nail scratches. Timur's father looked down at his chest, his shirt torn. The blood that ran down to the rim of his pants was forming lines at the edge now. I saw them. There were two of them. He repeated the answer when the elder asked him what had happened to his child. Go to the police. The elder pointed at his son quickly. My mother, the person and the patient can be found in all your favorite podcast apps. Please subscribe, listen, share, and follow. And join me next week for another episode of my mother's journey as both the person and the patient. Thank you.